Delmarva Today with Don Rush. State Senator Sarah McBride jumps into the race for Delaware's lone congressional seat. We'll have an exclusive interview. Two Eastern Shore cities hold pride parades, and Lewis marks the history of the African American community. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. In our studio this afternoon is Greg Bassett, editor and general manager for the Salisbury Independent, and on the phone, Susan Canfor, reporter for Coastal Point and a contributor to the Salisbury Independent. Welcome to the program. Hey, Don. Hi, Don. So, Susan, I want to start with you with the big news that, though not unexpected, that the state senator Sarah McBride is running for Delaware's lone congressional seat. And, of course, if she succeeds, she'd become the first transgender woman in the House of Representatives. What do we know? What was that announcement like? Well, she sure did. She announced. Uh, I got a press release about 6 o'clock Monday morning. So her, her team, uh, her press release team was very eager to get that information out. She is running for Congress. She announced on Monday she's running for the seat being vacated by Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. And that this woman is running for the Senate seat being vacated by Lo- the time senator and former Delaware governor Tom Carper. He announced his retirement a few weeks ago. I talked to Senator McBride early this week, right, not too long after the announcement, a couple hours afterward. Uh, we, we had a, a very uh, casual and friendly talk by Zoom, and she's just a delight. She really is. She's she just so down to earth. She was running around looking for her phone charger while she was talking to me. It's just such a typical conversation, you know, with a lawmaker. She is the highest ranking transsexual woman in the country, and um, she was very complimentary of Congresswoman Rochester. She said she called her a joy, joyful warrior, and she said that if she's elected, she will continue the legacy of Congresswoman Rochester. She's very focused on helping the average person, especially with problems they face that can really impact their daily lives. Things like, like being able to take time off work to care for family members or children or elderly parents who are sick. Her own husband died very young from cancer. He was only in his 20s. Although he had adequate health care, a lot of people don't. And some people can't afford health care, and they can't afford to take time off work even to be sick. And their families can't afford to take time off work to take care of them. So she worked very hard to get a bill passed. I think it was an act, actually, that allows Delaware employees to take off several weeks with pay to take care of six family members. And she told me she's also concerned about child care, that the average family just can't afford the availability, the too easy ability of a weapons, climate change, uh, the economy. She said never since the Civil War has this country faced such a confluence of problems, and she is very committed to solving them. I've talked to Senator McBride several times. She was in Bethany Beach a couple weeks ago speaking and I have another interview scheduled with her after the Delaware legislative session ends. And, Dawn, she is one of the most sincere, down-to-earth, caring people I think I've, I've ever met. I was very impressed by her. It, she's maybe somewhat of an unusual lawmaker, but I think we're going to see great things coming from her. She's only in her mid-30s. She has a long career ahead of her. And if we see her win and succeed Lisa Blunt Rochester, I think we'll see great things coming from this young lady. Well, one of the things, as a matter of fact, of course, is that she is transgender. How does she see that playing into, um, obviously, her legacy and the fact that it will have an impact, say, on other folks who are transgender? I think it will give other people who are transgender or are considering being transgender, you know, whose lives have gone that way and who are worried or scared to take that step. I think it will give them the courage to do that because they see this woman who's, you know, not only transgender but, but supported and so successful. She did say she doesn't want her campaign to be based on that. She said she will make history, and she's already made history. But if she wins this congressional seat, she will make history as a transsexual woman, but she doesn't want that to be the focus. She wants the focus to be on her hard work. Uh, I, think, I think she'll also be a good example for young people. She, uh, she did talk to one transsexual woman when she was in Bethany Beach, a young woman who stood up and said she's in the process of transitioning, and she wasn't able to find a job. And um, she, she wasn't quite there yet, and I was concerned that the audience might make fun of her or, you know, boo her, but everybody was just so welcoming and, and so accepting. And Senator McBride said, you know, I'm here to try to help people like you and everybody who's in any subgroup. And what has to really change is the heart of the country and the culture. That's where the change is going to start. But politics is a place where she feels like she can make the most change and have, have the most influence. Do we get a sense, by the way, as to whether or not she's getting some endorsements? I think she did from the Attorney General. I think so. There was a long list on the press release that I got. There was a long list of endorsements. 
And I think you're right. I know Senator Carper has endorsed her. Uh, Lisa Blunt Rochester has endorsed her. She, she seems to get along very well with people. She, she made her, when she was in Bethany Beach, she said that she's so used to being hated for who she is, you know, when, when, it, when she came out as transgender, that, you know, her pol- being hated for her policies is just, is just nothing. So she has, a, you know, she has a way of making a joke and, you know, lending a hand and extending a hand and, and just being an ordinary person who she's just so very easy to like and easy to trust. And, you know, she doesn't come across as, as she said, she's not a bomb thrower willing to work and she's willing to work on uh, in a bipartisan way and that really comes across when you talk to her well but Maverick, we're going to have an exclusive interview that you actually worked out for us uh, with her a little later in the program and then she did say by the way I asked her whether or not uh, she could see herself working with somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene or Boebert she said probably not but she would find Republicans <laughs> that she could <laughs> work for so uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see how that works out Greg um, Clearly, many are still not happy with the parking lot situation and the development that's going to be taking place there. Uh, we had the owner, by the way, of the Market Street Inn who uh, was quoted saying that he has concerns about the parking and his customers. W- what do we know at this point? There was a, a meeting, recent meeting. Yeah, there was a meeting on Wednesday that the city hosted uh, downtown, and it was a, a very proactive meeting, which is something that they, they acknowledged that they should have been doing all along in this situation uh, what happened here was that once the ground got broken, people started asking questions about what was going on, and there was uh, an information gap that needed to be filled. But this was a meeting between the downtown business stakeholders and the city, uh, and it was a really I, – I expected some more fireworks in this meeting, and there were none. Um, the city just sort of laid out what was going on. The people seemed responsive uh, to what was going on. They sort of uh, – uh, decided they were going to have to live with this situation uh, after having failed in the last vote uh, about an expansion of one of the developments. Um, and there was just some discussions about what can be done to refine some of the rules, whether they could have free two-hour parking, if there's they could add spaces to different areas, um, you know, questions about what the new parking garage downtown will look like and whether, whether there will be reserved spaces um, and they were also used the occasion to sort of vent about some of the problems they have. Um, one woman who has a salon talked about how she's got to literally go out to the cars of her customers and walk them in and out of the establishment, and that parking needs to be nearby for her business to thrive. So there was a good exchange of, of uh, information. They're going to meet again and talk about more things. This is just phase one uh, of the downtown redevelopment in terms of the the big structures. And there's a lot to sort through, but it was a very, very positive meeting. There were three council members there. They could not speak or address anyone because they would have had a a quorum. Um, So they they just had to sit there. But that was explained, that people understood. And uh, the business owners talked directly to the city. Very positive meeting. And we're going to have coverage about it in this week's paper. Let me ask you this, I mean, because it would seem to me that at least for a lot of the business owners, um, bringing a number of people that they expect to bring in, particularly on the residential side, as well as just simply bringing in more businesses, that that would then increase the amount of uh, business that they do, the more customers that they might have. I mean, is that do they recognize that? Or? Yeah. One of the points was that, yes, you know, we're going to get 3,000 residents living downtown within three to five years, but we've got to survive for those three to five years until those people mm. get here. Uh, And there's still a lot of external customers that come in from the county into the town just for the day as part of their routines to to do some retail work downtown or service stuff. Um, So there there needs to be that. And during the interim, we all learned a a bitter lesson when when West Main Street, the plaza was redeveloped and North Division, South Division was redeveloped. When those roads were closed for a long time, you saw a lot of businesses suffer for 10, 14 months while that work was going on. You saw Kuhn's Jewelers that had been on the downtown plaza for 100 years uh, move out to Seagull Square. So, you know, there, there was a transition during that construction, and there's concerns that there will be, you know, transition during this construction. But these people are really believe in downtown and want to hang in there. The other thing, uh, Greg, is that we have this blueprint for Maryland change for the Wacomico County and the education system. And I understand that there had been, at least earlier in the year, some some effort to uh, get some kind of delay in, in terms of the deadline. They might not meet it. What are we looking at there? Yeah, so July is the key month. So all the school systems in the state are about to submit or should have or, or right now are submitting their plans uh, for the blueprint for Maryland's future accountability. Um, and their plans all need to include things, which I thought ironic that Dr. Donna Hanley, when she was our, our superintendent previously, thinks that she stressed as part of her strategic goals. So I think Wicomico is, is on a good path toward this already. 
And those three most important things are early childhood ed- education, which we've added with the pre-K in Wicomico, um, hiring and retraining or retaining uh, high-quality diversity workforce, which was one of the, Dr. Hanlon's priorities, uh, and has also been adopted uh, certainly by Dr. Micah Stofer, her successor, and then preparing students for college and technical careers. Um, things that uh, the, the county focuses on right now, the county school board focuses on right now, so that should be good toward their blueprint submission. Um, the blueprints all go to a panel for approval. Um, if the panel kicks back uh, those documents, says, no, your plan's no good, redo it. They've got until October 1st to, to redo that. And the idea here is uh, an implementation of sometime in 2025. Uh, it's going to cost more money uh, in the counties and the state. State has found a way to pay for it. Counties are finding a way to pay for it. Um, but it's just the next step. Uh, we've kind of forgotten about this and put it aside while it's in a bureaucratic phase. But it's coming. Because one of the things I understand, one of the concerns, uh, at least earlier in the year, was whether or not they had the capacity here in Wakama County to serve all of the three- and four-year-old students, uh, whether they had enough space, that kind of thing. Are they confident that they can do that now? Or, or are, do you th- is there some sense that they're going to meet their deadlines? The last I've heard, uh, they are confident they are, yeah. and they're, they are going to meet their deadlines. Uh, actually, Dr. Stofer, when he was an assistant superintendent, was in charge of the blueprint um, so he was very involved in the, the uh, development of that plan. He's handed that off, but he's still obviously very involved. Um, but, it, there, you know, uh, attendance is down. Enrollment is down slightly um, through the pandemic and through other considerations. So I don't think there's going to be a problem with space. Susan, there were uh, a couple of pride parades that went on on the eastern shore, particularly, obviously, in Salisbury, um, probably the biggest of them all. Uh, what can you tell me a little bit about the turnout, particularly for, for Salisbury? And, and I know that uh, Ocean City, for instance, had a very small one in which there was a basically a couple of hours they sort of marched up and then came went down uh, the lower part of the of the boardwalk, and that was pretty much it. Uh, but uh, Salisbury was a, a slightly different uh, different event. Yeah, Salisbury was a really good time. I was there. I, I had a great time. Uh, there were two this weekend, one in Ocean City, both on Saturday. So Ocean City had its in the morning. And you're right, it was just a walk, one block walk on the boardwalk, I think from 1st Street to 2nd Street and then back down. I was at that one, but I heard, I heard it was a, a success. Not as many people as they probably like to see there in years to come, but there are plans to continue it, and they will be going before the Ocean City Council asking for uh, approval to have that annually. The same day, so last Saturday afternoon, there was a much larger Pride event in downtown Saturday. It started with a short parade on the downtown plaza. I guess about a 20-minute parade, and then it was followed by, followed by hours of, of merrymaking in the streets that were closed off with musical performances and, and friends seeing each other and hugging each other, bottles of water being handed out, and you know people who hadn't seen each other in a while introducing each other to their partners and their husbands and wives and their children. There were booths with jewelry for sale and T-shirts and all kinds of free items to pick up, bumper stickers and pens and things like that. Uh, Mayor Jack Keith was there. He got on the stage, and he very warmly welcomed the crowd. He said that he had marched earlier with his family members and that he was so proud of them, and he, he really issued a very warm welcome to everyone in the crowd. And you could tell by his words that he was very sincere. And Mayor Heath is a very warm and genuine man anyhow. But he was very sincere when he was at the Pride Parade. But everybody applauded. Uh, the highlight of the parade, of course, was the drag show. I have never been much of a fan of drag shows, but I stayed and I watched it. And honestly, Donna had a really good time. Everybody was having a good time. Most of the fans in the audience knew all the songs. They had their favorite drag artists. Many of them jumped off the stage or walked down the steps on, onto the street and they danced and sang with the people in the street. Fans were handing them money, $1 bills, $5 bills, $20 bills, and they were walking off with stacks of bills. They don't do that for journalists, but I think that would be a nice thing to start. Uh, the money in their hands was, you know, was obviously one of the things they enjoyed, but you could tell they were really enjoying being there with the crowd as well. Everyone had a great time in the town, very supportive. I was there representing the Salisbury Independent, one of my favorite newspapers, and I had a good time, and I really hope we see these pride events continue in both Ocean City and in Salisbury. Uh, Salisbury had a, a sign up on one of, the, one of the light posts that said, we welcome everyone, we accept everyone. And that, you know, it's been way too long since we've, we've had that kind of, of acceptance locally and nationwide and certainly worldwide. And it was really, it was very heartwarming to see that. So I would certainly pronounce it a success, and I think the town probably will as well. Greg, I saw you there. 
Yes, and you know, in terms of economic development uh, and economics in downtown, there's been you know two weekends in a row of very successful events downtown. There was the Juneteenth event uh, the previous weekend, and then um, the Pride Parade this past weekend and festival. Um, you know, downtown really being used by hundreds of people uh, for very special purposes and just a success all around for the city. Now, also, Greg, uh, we have the legalization of marijuana that's coming in in um, July, the recreational use anyway. What is Wicomico County uh, saying about it? I know there were some concerns by the, the local health department there. Um, what, what, do we, what do we know? Yeah, so the law takes effect um, January 1. It was approved last year in the referendum. It had about 67% approval statewide. And basically what the law allows is that um, – uh, right. People can possess up to 1.5 ounces of marijuana, uh, and you're allowed to cultivate two plants uh, at your home. There's a lot of confusion about whether you can smoke marijuana in public, and you cannot. Now, some municipalities have uh, uh, added to the law, so they've they've put restrictions within their own areas. For example, in Ocean City, um, you can't smoke marijuana on the beach. Um, you can't smoke it um, in designated smoking areas. And in fact, everywhere you you're not supposed to smoke marijuana in public. So it's it's just it's not permitted. It's not you're not supposed to smoke it in your car. Um, so anywhere a public place would include any outdoor spaces and indoor spaces that are open to the public, uh, including parks, streets, sidewalks, bars, restaurants, public transportation, uh, and indoor places of employment. How this is all going to be enforced and what's going to happen? You know, that's uh, the Wild West is still to come on that. Um, I know there are, uh, you know, marijuana is still illegal at, on the federal level. Um, so you cannot possess uh, marijuana on any federal property, such as a national park. So an uh, Assateague National Refuge would, in, would be included in that. You would not be permitted to have marijuana down there. Um, but again, enforcement and how this is going to be done is another issue. It's been a, 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 a long time issue on the boardwalk in Salisbury. Uh, no, <laughs> the boardwalk in Ocean City. When people are smoking marijuana and the police have to arrest them and process them and take them uh, in for, for processing, and then you take an officer off the boardwalk, which is a problem. So they've been, they've, you know, they came up with a ticket system to sort of process people quickly. And I think that's the system we're going to end up with uh, now uh, statewide. And we also have some concerns about, from the health department about the long term effects, short term effects of this kind of stuff. Yeah, there's a, you know there's the, no. the, the concern that no one knows. Uh, yeah. No one knows what the concerns are going to be or what the health effects are going to be, uh, and there's a lot of debate about that. But also, there doesn't seem to be a lot of problems in the public with that issue. And Susan, um, we got some fireworks uh, going on out there. Uh, let's start with you first. What do we know about that? Obviously, Ocean City is going to have some, but uh, some of the cities or areas have decided not to have them or have canceled some of them. What what's going on? Yes, yes, up in Bethany Beach, there's a very uh, uh, disappointed group of people, and you know the residents are disappointed, the business business owners are disappointed. So Bethany Beach, a mayor and town council decided to cancel the fireworks because beach replenishment is going on up there in Bethany Beach, and they're not sure, you know, exactly where it'll be happening. And they they said the beach won't be big enough. The beaches that are available aren't large enough to shoot off fireworks. They thought about having them out on a barge in the in the ocean. And I talked to the mayor there, Mayor Rosemary Hardiman, who's the mayor of Bethany Beach. And she said that they tried it on a barge one time, and you know, a big wave came up and washed half the fireworks into the ocean. And <laughs> plus, you have to add like another $10,000 onto the cost if you know, the Coast Guard has to approve. And it's a very big, it's a very, very big and complicated change you know, if they put them on a barge. So even though a lot of the business owners are complaining, they did cancel them, and they rescheduled them for Labor Day weekend. And the mayor said that even though there are a few very loud business owners who, who are really upset about canceling the 4th of July fireworks, they're looking forward to having them on Labor Day because that's kind of the weekend when kids are going back to school and not a lot of people are in town. So she's thinking that'll bring more people back to town to have them on Labor Day. And the same thing happened in Millsboro. Millsboro had a big event called Stars and Strikes planned at Cupola Park. This Chamber of Commerce has had been planning it for months. Last weekend, because of the storms, they decided early, like two or three days in advance, to cancel it. And then Saturday came and the sun was out and they could have had it. They could have had it after all. But you know what they say about Monday morning quarterbacks. Anyhow, they're going to have theirs on Labor Day as well. But in Ocean Pines, in Ocean City, and I think in um, Salisbury, Greg would know better than I do. I'm not sure about Salisbury. But in Ocean Pines, at the casino, at the Ocean Downs Casino, they will have fireworks Tuesday night at dusk. 
and also in Ocean City at 9 o'clock at Northside Park. They'll be having fireworks both at Northside Park on 125th Street and on the boardwalk at 698 North Atlantic Avenue, which is right about 7th Street on the boardwalk. And they'll have live music to accompany the fireworks in Ocean City downtown, and I think at Northside Park as well. And one more, Don, will be in, um, in Ocean Pines. They already have it all fenced off and ready to go, and that'll be at the Veterans Park, which is right at the south gate of Ocean Pines, and that will also be, I think, the festivities start around 6 o'clock, and then the fireworks are scheduled for 9 o'clock. So there's three big ones in, in Wicomico County, all very close to each other, four if you count Northside Park. But in Delaware, they're disappointed they're not having them this year, so that means they'll all be coming down to Ocean City no doubt. So look out for the traffic if you're in town. Greg, we have uh, obviously the fireworks here, red, white, and boom. Red, white, and boom. Tuesday night, uh, 9.15 is when they shoot off the fireworks. Uh, gates open at 6 p.m. This year it's back at the shipyard, uh, which is the stadium, the football lacrosse stadium, soccer stadium at James M. Bennett High School on uh, East College Avenue in Salisbury. Uh, it's a good time. Uh, there's food tents, uh, food trucks, uh, things for the kids to do. Uh, music from one of the radio stations, uh, bring your chairs, t uh, blankets, sit on the field, sit in the stands. Uh, fun show, long show, and uh, a great tradition that had returned to Salisbury 13 years ago. It seems like just last week it came back. Salisbury was embarrassed not to have fireworks for several years. They just couldn't get their act together. Uh, but this thing is going going on, going really successfully, and it's just a great time. Give us a sense, by the way, the, the history of this, because I mean, uh, it was uh, it was not too long ago, well, enough now it is, I guess, but that uh, they didn't have this kind of major event, or certainly didn't call it uh, Red, White, and Boom. Yeah, the, the forever, um, it was done, the JCs uh, organized it at the old Salisbury Mall, uh, and then the mall got torn down, JCs sort of downsized a little bit the city didn't want to contribute there was there's not really a great geographical place in salisbury to have this or there at least there wasn't the vision for it uh it was uh, you know there was a co-sponsorship with the center of salisbury mall for a while so it was up there um but mike dunn and w uh, got the idea 13 years ago he just decided it was not acceptable for salisbury not to have a fireworks show or that the only fireworks that we ever got to see were out of shorebird stadium as, as part of a connection with that um, so got an endowment going, uh, an account at the community foundation, started to raise some money, put two guys in charge of it. And it's been a great success. And it's just, it's funny to be around Mike. I, I've had lunch with him a couple of times and people will come up to the table even today and thank him for red, white, and boom. And, you know, he shucks it off, uh, because there's so many people that went into making this thing work. But, uh, again, one of those, you know, citizen got mad, took action and you know, our community is better for it. Should by the mention that uh, Mike Dunn was also our development director at one point here at the radio That's station. That's correct, yes. Well, we've been speaking with Greg Bassett. He's editor and general manager for the Salisbury Independent. And on the phone, Susan Canfor, reporter for Coastal Point and a contributor to the Salisbury Independent. Appreciate you both of you uh, joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Don. You're listening to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Delmarva Today with Don Rush.